hosted by the Pine Lake Cemetery. This has occurred each year since 1983, begun by Ledge Tomlinson and Pastor Jack Freed. On most days, we would be delighted to travel from our homes to attend this important occasion in person at the cemetery. We would be grateful for the, the warmth of the day and the absence of rain for this gathering this morning. But because of the COVID-19 pandemic and limitations placed on numbers of people that can safely meet together, organizers of the event made the decision to host this Memorial Day service using Zoom technology to allow the most number of people to attend as possible without the concerns involved in, in leaving our homes. So a theme for this day and these unusual circumstances is a reminder of the ways in which individuals in past difficult situations in this country, particularly during World War II, came together in times of challenge sacrificing much for the common good, the safety, and the welfare of all. We especially acknowledge today those who gave up their lives for our protection. We're called on to live out a different type of sacrifice today, but with the benefit of our entire country, if not our world in heart and in mind. Scriptures, poetry, and other aspects of the service today will have the betterment of community through shared sacrifice as a focus. I want to thank Chris Cooper for coming up with the idea to hold this service virtually this year and for all of the work that he's done to make it possible for us to share this time despite the challenges. Much gratitude to Mary Bam and the Pine Lake Cemetery Association for promoting this event with a large banner in front of the fence of the cemetery multiple boxes placed at the gates and in the cemetery to find information about the service and balloons to mark these locations. Rick from uh, Graph Shop really did uh, make possible the banner that was used to publicize this event. Also the effort of several volunteers in placing flags at the graves of veterans, one of the most significant ways that we honor this day and the beautification of the cemetery for Memorial Day are very, very much appreciated. One of the most meaningful parts of the service is being able to visit together before and after the formal event takes place and to walk around the cemetery. There are those who others only see at this service each year. And we will miss that. We do miss that. However, please do if you are able take some time to drive through the cemetery, maintain social distance and be safe, and value the sacrifices of so many who gave so much, and even who gave all for the many freedoms that we enjoy today. We're glad that you are all with us remotely to recognize this solemn day. And at this time, I will invite the Reverend William Matlack from the Holy Spirit Lutheran Church here in West Bloomfield to open us in prayer with an invocation. Thank you, Charles. It's good to be here. And uh, yes, I have a invocation prayer. God of all, on this day, we call to mind those who gave their lives that our nation might live. In a spirit of community, we pause to remember lives lost and lives forever changed in war. May we also remember your great love for us, and there is no greater demonstration of love than to lay down one's life for another. Grant that our reflections today honor those who made that choice, as well as the many more willing to do so if they are called upon. To honor their legacy, we commit ourselves to be more vigilant in our love for others, for our nation, the cause of freedom, justice, and peace throughout the world. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Matlack. There are several things that happen now at the opening 
that usually happen at the opening of this service uh, that uh, um, are, are very visual. And uh, we will not be able to exactly recreate those, but we're grateful to the, the many individuals who ordinarily would, would make these things happen that have uh, helped us to uh, bring these elements into this service, albeit remotely. And uh, ordinarily we would have uh, right here at the start of the service, um, a, a presentation of colors by the, the West Bloomfield Township Police Department uh, Honor Guard and uh, um, Chief uh, Michael Patton has recorded a message of greeting for us uh, in lieu of uh, that presentation of colors. And so uh, we will now hear from uh, Chief of Police, Michael Patton. I'm Mike Patton, the Chief of Police of the West Bloomfield Police Department. As we are unable to physically be together this Memorial Day to remember the members of our armed forces that made the ultimate sacrifice in service of our great nation due to the global COVID-19 pandemic, we are taking advantage of our virtual and online opportunities to join together. For most Americans, this has been a very difficult and trying time. Many lives have been lost. Many more have become ill and are still recovering. When will this great scourge pass us by? When will life return to our community? As with all of our nation's greatest challenges, Americans have always persevered. We have always been able to improvise, adapt, and overcome, achieving eventual victory in the greatest of battles. This time will be no different. Our great nation will endure, our freedom will endure, as we never forget those that made the ultimate sacrifice for that freedom, both then and now. Please join me in rejoicing. God bless America. Thank you to Chris and thank you to Chief Michael Patton for sharing those words. And now uh, we will have, uh, we will hear the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem uh, played, or uh, sung rather, by Jenny Lynn Stewart, uh, who we will hear from shortly uh, as our keynote presenter uh, from New York City. Thank you, Jenny, for sharing that with us. It was beautiful. And now we are very grateful to have with us representatives of Girl Scout Troop 43681 from Waterford, Michigan. And the uh, Scout Troop leader is Amy Nelson. 
and they will be leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And ordinarily at this point in the service, um, a representative from the um, West Bloomfield Township Board of Supervisors, usually uh, our, our township supervisor, Steve Kaplan, would be present physically placing a wreath and then saying a few words. There is a beautiful wreath uh, at, uh, uh, at the cemetery right now where it usually would be, um, but we will uh, not see Steve Kaplan place that wreath, but we will hear him share some words at this time. Thank you, Supervisor Kaplan, for being with us today. Um, Steve, you are muted. Charles, can you hear me now? Go on. Thank you, Pastor Packer. On behalf of the seven person elected township board, it's my honor to participate. This of course is a somber day and in light of the pandemic even more somber, I thought I would share with you exploits of three heroes. But before I tell you about those heroes, because really anyone who who participates, who serves in the armed forces is a hero, likely or possibly giving up his freedom and his health and his life. When I, before I tell you about these heroes though, there are thousands of people who have given their lives, hundreds of thousands worldwide, all in the idea of liberty and, and civilization. And these people aren't necessarily known. They're known to their loved ones and they're known to their colleagues and maybe they're known to their commanders. But President Kennedy in 1943, he was a Navy commander, a PT-109 boat. And on August 1, 1943 in the Solomon Islands, his ship was struck by a torpedo. And he courageously led several of the victims in that boat to shore. And there's an interesting sidelight to this. But when he was asked, he was told he was a hero. He said, I'm no hero, my boat was hit by a shell. And then we have Senator John McCain, who on October 26, 1967, was taken as a prisoner of war in Hanoi. And his father and grandfather were military heroes in the Navy. What's striking about Senator McCain is that he was given an opportunity eight months later to leave. Instead, he served five and a half years as a prisoner of war, and he refused to leave captivity unless his, his fellow soldiers or, or Navy were allowed to leave. And he said, I'm not leaving, would demoralize them. And there's a custom that those who have been here the longest are the ones who first are allowed to leave. But then you have Joseph McCarthy, excuse me, Joseph Kennedy Jr., not a well-known person, but the older brother of President Kennedy, born two years before President Kennedy. So Joseph Kennedy Jr. was viewed as the politician in the family. He was going to run for Congress in 1946. And his father had designs that his son, Joseph Jr., would be president one day. 1944, he dies on August 12. And why does he die? He volunteered for a mission where he, he would be flying a drone, so to speak. He would exit from the plane as the plane entered into Normandy to knock out the, the launching sites for, the German, for Germany for the uh, weapons. And the plane exploded and he died. Now, many historians believe that he volunteered for this mission, which he realized was a 50-50 likelihood of success, meaning 50% chance he would die because he, it was not that he was competing with his brother, but he felt that he needed to do something even more heroic to show how much he loved his nation. So the irony is one could say that both Joseph Kennedy Jr. and President Kennedy died as a result of PT-109. How is that? Because President Kennedy wore a back brace on the day he was shot, the day he was assassinated. The back brace stemmed from injuries he suffered while commanding PT-109 on August 1, 1943. 
So had he not been wearing the back brace, the first bullet that entered the back of his neck and through his throat was not a fatal or paralytic wound. He would have lived, but he was unable to slump down in the seat. And the second shot we know, or the third shot, killed him. And one could say that Joseph Kennedy Jr. died because he, because PT-109, he wanted to try to match his brother. Well, having said all that, we have other heroes in society. I know this is Memorial Day. We're honoring the armed sort the armed forces, but here in our community and every community, we have heroes that belong on Mount Rushmore. They are, of course, the healthcare providers, the first responders in the, during this paramedic, and also the healthcare professionals, physicians, nurses, medical assistants, respiratory therapists. Many of them have jeopardized their life, health, because they care and they're, they're treating patients who are very sick. And so we, they are additional heroes and they belong on Mount Rushmore too. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Ka Kaplan. Very much appreciated. And now we will have a series of readings, scripture and poetry um, regarding the theme of the day. And uh, first, I would invite Reverend Monica William of the West Bloomfield United Methodist Church to share a reading of the well-known 23rd Psalm. Thank you, Charles. I invite you to just join together with me as we meditate on these words that so many of us know so well. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He to the Your rod hurt me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my, my head with oil. Overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And Thank you, Reverend William. And now I will invite Rabbi Marla Hornston of Temple Israel in West Bloomfield to share our Hebrew scripture reading this day, taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 41, verses 8 through 10. Be'ata Yisrael avdi Yaakov, asher b'charticha zera Abraham ohavi. But you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the children of Abraham, my friend, you whom I drew from the ends of the earth and called from its far corners, to whom I said, you are my servant. I chose you. I have not rejected you. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not frightened, for I am your God. I strengthen you and I help you. I uphold you with my victorious right hand. Thank you, Rabbi Hornston, a reminder of God's abiding presence in all circumstances and God's help, even in challenging times. I will now ask Rich Lunau from Prince of Peace Catholic Church to share our New Testament Christian scripture reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 14, and verses 18 through 26. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, 
I have no need for you, nor the head to the feet. I have no need for you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with great honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the members may have the same care for one another, if one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Thank you, Rich, for sharing that. Paul's words keep before us the reality that all parts of the community are vitally important for the health and well being of the entire community, and that we are all connected. And our final reading today will be from Clinton Copus from the Pine Hill Congregational Church, and he will share a, a historic poem that is yet relevant to us today The Influenza by Winston Churchill. And in the poem, uh, the great uh, influenza pandemic of the late 19th century is, is likened in uh, imagery to military combat. And so I will mute myself and Clinton, we will hear the influenza. Thank you. The Influenza, written by Churchill at the age of 15, published in 1890. Oh, how shall I its deeds recount or measure the untold amount of ills that it has done? From China's bright celestial land, even to Arabia's thirsty sand, it, it journeyed with his sun. Over miles of bleak Siberia's plains where Russians' exiles toil in chains, it moved with no, noiseless tread, and as it slowly glided by, there followed it across the sky the spirits of the dead. The Ural peaks by it were scaled, and every bar and barrier failed to turn it away from its way. Slowly and surely on it came, heralded by its awful fame, increasing day by day. On Moscow's fair and famous town, where fell the first Napoleon's crown, it made a direful swoop. The rich, the poor, the high, the low, alike the various symptoms know, alike before it droop. Nor adverse winds nor floods of rain might stay the thrice accursed bane. And with unsparing hand, impartial, cruel, and severe, it traveled on, allied with fear, and smote the fatherland. Fair Alsace and forlorn Lorraine, the cause of bitterness and pain. In many a Gallic breast received the vile, insatiate scourge, and from their towns with it emerge and never stay or rest. And now Europa groans aloud, and neath the heavy thundercloud, hushed is both song and dance. The germs of illness wend their way to westward each successive day, or succeeding day, and enter merry France. Fair land of Gaul, thy patriots fear, who fear not death and scorn the grave, cannot this foe oppose. Those loathsome hand and cruel to sting, whose poisonous breath and blighted wing Full well thy cities know. In Calais port, the illness stays, as did the French in former days, to threaten freedom's isle. But now, no Nelson could o'erthrow this cruel, unconquerable foe, nor save us from its guile. Yet Father Neptune strove right well to moderate this plague of hell and thwart it in its course. And though it passed the streak of brine and penetrated this thin line, it came with broken force. For though it ravaged far and wide, both village town and countryside, its power to kill was o'er. And with the favoring winds of spring, 
blessed is the time of which I sing, it left our native shore. God shield our empire from the blight of war, the might of war, or famine, plague, or blight, and all the power of hell, and keep it ever in the hands of those who fought against other lands, who fought and conquered well. Thank you, Clinton, for sharing that with us. We are pleased this year to have with us Jenny Lynn Stewart, internationally acclaimed operatic soprano from New York City, who not only sang the national anthem that we heard just a short bit ago, but who will now provide a keynote address that will bring inspiration and encouragement in the midst of troubled times. Stuart will draw from both her personal and family's experiences, the latter with regard to the Second World War and the former relating to living in a city and region so greatly affected by the, uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic. Jenny Lynn Stewart has held title roles in Aida and Tosca, portrayed Nettie Fowler in Carousel, and was the mother abbess in The Sound of Music opposite Marie Osmond. In recent years, Stewart has performed often her one woman show, Give a Little Bit More, Richard Rogers Revisited. She earned degrees in television and radio from Michigan State University and voice performance from the University of Michigan. Stewart further studied in Europe, including in Austria and Italy. She was raised in Downriver, Michigan and still has family in the area. It is a delight now to introduce to you Jenny Lynn Stewart. Well, thank you, Dr. Packer. I'm very honored to be here today and I hope I don't start crying. <laughs> Since the beginning of the worldwide pandemic of COVID-19, many have compared our current situation with World War II. And I wanna mention this morning I checked, so far we have had 97,772 deaths in the United States from COVID virus more than the combined totals of the fatalities in the Vietnam War and the Korean War. This is a war. Dr. Packer asked me to compare the, uh, the two, COVID-19 with World War II, based on the fact, which he already mentioned, that my parents are World War II veterans, and I live here in New York City, the epicenter of the coronavirus in the United States. My story this morning begins in February of 2016 when out of the blue, my sister sent me an email with a scanned copy of my father's discharge papers from the army. Well, I noticed that my father, Amos Stewart Jr., entered the army on February 25th, 1941. And Debbie sent that email to me on February 25th, 1916, exactly 75 years later. My father was only 22 at the time and already a journeyman carpenter. Well, I started to think about what I was doing when I was 22 years old. Well, I was in college and I was looking toward my graduation from television and radio at Michigan State. And you know, I really was never a party girl. I know Michigan State has a rep you know, reputation of being big party school. Well, I wasn't much of a party girl, but you know what? I was living a pretty carefree life and I was not thinking about being separated from my family and certainly not about fighting in a world war. President Roosevelt signed the Selective Training and Service Act on September 16, 1940, our country's first peacetime draft. The act limited military service to 12 months, unless deemed by Congress to extend the service. So I remember my mom telling me that when my dad entered the army, he thought he would be in the army for 12 months and then go on with his, with his life. Well, six months after he entered the army, Congress passed an amendment extending the time to 18 months. Next, the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. 12 days later, Congress passed another amendment extending the term of service until the duration of the war. Well, at that point, my father's plans and dreams just went up in smoke and definitely were put on hold. Finally, four years, three months, and 15 days later, my father received his honorable discharge from the United States Army. 
what dreams did that 22 year old man have when he entered the military? You know, I don't know because I never asked him, but I do know that his life changed along with everyone else in the United States on December 7th, 1941. Meanwhile, my mom, Bonnie Butler Stewart, lived on a farm with her family in Iowa, where Reverend Packer grew up. She listened to President Roosevelt's fireside chats, and sometime after high school, she decided she wanted to join the Navy. Well, she was too young to enter, so my grandparents had to sign and give their consent. So mom entered the Navy on April 4th, 1944, and served mostly in naval hospitals like Bethesda Hospital. And also I know she was at a big hospital in Long Beach and I don't know the name, sorry. Uh, until she received her honorable discharge on February 8th, 1946. Now also right now, I want to remember and honor my uncle Walt, my uncle Walter Stewart, who was a POW in Germany. You know, he never complained about anything. You know, he considered himself lucky to have been captured by the Germans rather than the Japanese because 40% of the Americans sadly captured by the Japanese never came home. Last week, I spoke to my friend Dorothy Welker who celebrated her 100th birthday on May 2nd. Dorothy lives independently in Kansas. She was a nurse in the Navy during World War II. She was stationed at Norco Naval Hospital in Corona, California. I asked Dorothy about her experiences during World War II and how she could compare that experience with her current experience with COVID-19. Well, her first response was, World War II went on for years. The war with coronavirus has only been going on a few months. You know, today t people talk about not being able to see their loved ones after they have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Well, Dorothy was assigned to the tuberculosis and rheumatic fever ward at Norco. No one was allowed to visit those patients. She even remembers that one Christmas AT&T offered one free long distance phone call for each patient in the hospital, except for those patients on the TB and rheumatic fever ward. The diseases were too contagious. Dorothy also talked about our channels of communications have changed drastically. During World War II, there was no television, no cell phone, no personal computers, no Skype, no FaceTime, and certainly no Zoom. It could take months to receive information about a loved one. In March, of 1945, my uncle Kenny Dale, who was a gunner in the back of a plane, was badly hit on a mission over France. The crew thought they were going down, but somehow they managed to get that plane back into friendly territory. My uncle was not expected to survive, and among his extensive injuries, he lost his right eye. While in the hospital, he learned that he had a son who had been born in January. My Aunt Lois didn't know about the extent of my uncle's injuries for months. Now today, communication is instantaneous. Our service men and women can receive information about their family members within minutes. You know, another thing Dorothy pointed out to me was how World War II was not fought on our soil. And she specifically mentioned the bombings in England. So I spoke with two friends who grew up in England during World War II. And both of them said that we think, or they think rather, that we here in the United States are not taking the COVID virus war seriously. And they both said, we are at war. Only this time, we can't see the enemy. Now I wanna point out both of these women uh, do not know each other. One lives in California, one lives here in New York City, and they both said the same thing. They remembered every night having to take their pillows and sleep on the platforms of the underground. It was scary. They heard the bombs dropping and they remembered sometimes seeing the flashes of light from the bombs. Eventually, Leah's family was able to move outside London and initially lived in one room. Quickly, 
the family of five came down with the measles. And Liz remembers getting sick with diphtheria, another airborne and highly infectious disease. Now we have vaccines for both. With all of our advances in medical science, hopefully we will have a vaccine along with a cure for COVID-19 soon. So here I am, I'm living in the epicenter of COVID-19 here in the United States. And as I look back at what my relatives, all our veterans and others have endured through the years, you know, I look at my life and I think I've had it pretty easy. I'm grateful that I live in a lovely apartment and I feel safe here. I live across the street from Inwood Hill Park here in Manhattan, and I can look out my window and I see beautiful trees and I hear the birds sing. I choose to focus on things that I can control and keep a positive mindset. So I leave you today with one final thought. Be strong and know that we are all in this together. Now I know we're all sick of hearing that cliche, me too, at the end of the news day, oh, we're all in this together. But you know what? We are all in this together. It may be stormy now, but it never rains forever. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Much to think about and, and uh much to be inspired by in that. Thank you for sharing those narratives and, and your thoughts. You're welcome. <laughs> You're looking at the screen. I don't know if I'm supposed to say something. <laughs> now we will hear taps now by Peter Cooper. Gratitude again to Jenny Lynn Stewart for sharing our keynote message to all who participated and shared readings, thoughts, and, uh, and prayers, and to Peter for playing taps for us and recording that uh, from the uh, Pine Lake Cemetery. And now, uh, oh, and uh, I also, uh, do um, want to mention thanks to Civic Center TV 15 uh, for being present with us and recording our service um, and uh, uh, showing it on, on cable, which is a, a wonderful thing and glad that this could, uh, could take place for us today. So let us now receive our benediction as we uh, prepare to go forth in this Memorial Day. May the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace as we remember and give thanks for the sacrifices of so many who assured the health, safety, and well-being of others, including all of us. Go forth and let this day bring us together in new and different ways, held in the desire to give something of our comfort and our ease for the benefit of our communities, our nation, and our world. Amen. <laughs>